Hi, my name is Roger Thomas and I'm the founder of the Roger Thomas Collection. Whatever I'm designing, tabletop accessories, giant resorts, or my very own long dreamed of retreat, my work is always informed by history. Creating my own retreat there has been the culmination of many years of dreaming and then practical searching and planning. I was thrilled to at last find this perfect spot across the canal in the building you see here. With a great vantage point overlooking the city's main thoroughfare lined by some of the world's most extraordinary art and architecture. The location and the aura of history make Ca del Duca Sforza, as it's known, a perfect retreat in which I am literally surrounded by the beauty and inspiration of a glorious past. The building we now call home is named after Ludovico Sforza, who was the Duke of Milan in the late 1400s. At the height of the Italian Renaissance, he was both a shrewd political leader and a patron of Leonardo da Vinci. It was during this time that he built the foundation of his palazzo. The politics and alliances of Italy's city-states got in the way of his Venice building plans. He never finished a planned residence on the site, but later structures on the site housed the studio of Titian, the great Venetian master. Veronese also worked at the site. Alas, my husband Arthur and I live in the present. To bask comfortably required a lot of very modern work. All in, two years of work lay ahead. All the mechanical, the plumbing, all the wiring, all the windows had to be new. That gave me plenty of time to develop the few important guiding ideas that help keep any project I work on interesting, cohesive, and flowing. Color, of course, is a first consideration. Here, I realized I could merely turn to the Grand Canal flowing by outside. In most of the main floor rooms, the tone matches the flowing waters in the afternoon light. This 18th century Canaletto captures the same light that captured me. Let me extend a very warm virtual welcome inside the apartment here in the actual entry. As you enter, you'll notice at the center of this grouping a cabinet de violin created by French designer Eugène Prince in the 1930s. This piece played a key role as inspiration for some of the furnishings in my new collection for Global Views. The legs of the cabinet have a particularly distinctive silhouette. The legs of the Paris desk, wall console, and spot table in my new collection owe a debt to this favorite piece. The thought for this collection began when I acquired a small table by René Prou in Paris 15 years ago. I also had in mind this beautiful, small black desk made in 1930 by the master of the modern, Jean-Michel Franck, and also this René Prou 1934 chest with drawers, and his console of the same year. You'll see these themes again as I share more of the pieces in the Paris collection. Above the cabinet is a favorite 17th century painting by Luca Giordano. It is flanked by a pair of delightful mirrors by 20th century Italian architect Paolo Buffa. The gilded sconces you see here and elsewhere were made for us in Paris, but I am already thinking of replacing this pair with my new quatrefoil sconces for global views. The walls here and in other rooms are simply painted in Benjamin Moore hues, matching the flowing canal waters outside. To distinguish them, I added a two-inch woven ribbon from Samuel and Sons as a border. And here in the hall, I added my own Samuel and Sons design, the Donato embroidered appliques you can see in the corners of the panels. Across the hall, I placed this wonderful African-inspired stool made in Paris in the 1930s, which Arthur and I found many years ago at the Gallery Patrick Fortin. If any of you have watched the Netflix series Emily in Paris, his gallery on the Place de Vosges figures prominently as the location of her office. 
This remarkable sculptural creation was an inspiration for my Shanghai stool. The apartment had last been renovated in the early 1950s, around the time I was born. It was showing its age, very much more in some rooms than in others, and we'll see those later on. The elegant proportions of this central space with a fireplace flanked by pairs of doors giving on to the Grand Canal sold me on its potential. Now it has become a functional and comfortable gathering space. The large central seating area invites relaxing with friends and family. This conversation island is going to be the perfect place for my new Alexander rug. Its black on ivory palette will be a dramatic complement to the terrazzo floor, which, like all the other terrazzo floors in the apartment, is original. Throughout the apartment, we've been lucky to source all our textiles from Rubelli. We count the Rubelli family as our best friends in Venice. I've been working closely with them for two decades on the fabrics for walls, draperies, and upholstery in some of the largest spaces in my hotel projects. This was a chance to use all of my favorite Rubelli designs. The Rubelli family created the large upholstered pieces using their exquisite fabrics. I found many of the decorative light fittings for these and other rooms at auctions in Paris or at dealers in Venice or Florence. They are all 20th century Venetian creations by designers whose work I admire. The chandelier here is by John Hutton, made nearby on the island of Murano. The wall sconces are from the 1930s by Carlo Scarpa, another talented native of Venice. Fireside are two very comfortable John Hutton lounge chairs and a Jean Sen Louis Seize ottoman, which I bought at Sotheby's in Paris, for intimate conversations and for reading. This seating group can also join the central grouping for larger parties. Here, I look forward to placing a piece from my new Copenhagen ceramic collection on the Ottoman tray. The pair of 18th century Athenens flanking the fireplace with its 18th century mantle hold a pair of my golden glass rope lamps, the perfect place for flattering and functional lighting. On the next visit though, you might find a pair of my Alexander lighted urns. They might be even more dramatic. I left many of the original doors in place, as well as the delightful relief paneling in the living room, an addition of the 1950s. We had all of the door and window hardware created for us by Velese, a bronze foundry here in Venice. My desk is intentionally large to be a convenient and practical place for work. It is a beauty by de Confrère of Belgium dating to the 1930s. The formal strong black lacquer finish of the desk works with the large companion buffet at the other end of the room to frame the central seating areas. The pairing creates a wonderful grouping for the large 18th century paintings. The paired 19th century green marble columns flanking the desk are far too tall to hold lamps. These two tall columns will soon be topped off by a pair of the large Grecian amphora vases in my Global Views collection. Elsewhere, I have always paired columns with lamps to flank doorways. They bring side light to faces at standing height, always very flattering and inviting. Thus arises the inspiration for the new column floor lamp. When conceiving this lamp, I was also inspired by Alberto Giacometti's 1936 vase lamp on a stand. And the vase form on top of the column floor lamp is a version of the Kyoto vase I originally created for an earlier Studio A collection. And that, in turn, was inspired by this beautiful Lekithos from the classical Greek era around the 4th century BCE and part of my personal collection. Instead of the columns, this side of the living room could also be a perfect spot for a pair of my new Proust 
pedestals in black ceruzed oak. I could top them off with this Grecian amphora vase. The matte white color is inspired by the plaster Paris vases created by Alberto Giacometti for Jean-Michel Franck in the 1930s. Or possibly with a pair of my lyric sculptures in antique gold turned in opposite directions for symmetry. Or with my Anasazi vessel on a stand to bring my love for the elegance and interest of Native American ceramics into an Italian room. Or even finally, I could consider a pair of my new Lumiere candle holders for the animating romance of candlelight and a burst of Bernini. In the main conversation area, the four Louis Seize fauteuils by Georges Jacob date to 1787. They are part of the inspiration for the Paris collection's new Seine dining chair. My favorite form of the original Louis Seize chair with a square back can be seen in this magnificent example from the same year by the same maker, Jacob, who was ebeniste to King Louis Seize. Another inspiration is this modernized pair based on 18th century examples upholstered in scaparelli pink designed by Jean-Michel Franck. The Seine dining chairs are even more refined, with beautiful box frame carved detailing echoing the elegant lines of their original 18th century great-great-great-grandparents. The sweeping curve of the arm is completely simplified, now very sleek and totally modern. Flanking the sofa are a pair of Quintus Gia N tables. Quintus is a favorite source of mine given my partnership in the company. I would love to use a pair of my facet lamps with white marble bases here. They have been inspired by the glass column lamps I have used throughout my career, like the 1960s pair currently in the room which we found at the Parma Fair. I have always loved light floating above end tables on the sparkle and shimmer of transparent glass. This central 1950s Italian black lacquer and glass coffee table is the perfect place to display treasured objects. I'm considering a footed compote in bronze to hold some of the quartz facets or for floating orchids. These footed compotes were inspired by the shapes of 18th century Italian tazza, which were in turn inspired by ancient Roman examples and made for the grand tour. They were usually made in stone, like this beautiful example in rare giallo sienna marble. Another inspiration is the updated form found on the finials of this 1930s bed by French master André Arbus. And another option for the tabletop will be my new glass doge's cup, which is made near Venice. That was inspired by the Murano glass master Vittorio Zecchin and by the innovative mind of Dagobert Pekka, who created this extraordinary silver and ivory creamer in 1919 for the Wiener Werkstatt. When we bought the apartment, this room was being used as a bedroom. We couldn't resist the opportunity to create a spot to dine and entertain with a view of the Grand Canal. I always love dining in a library, and I rely on the large collection of reference books for my work. The table functions especially well when I have multiple books open for research. It's delightful to think and work here. The table top of polished black oyster mother of pearl is a fitting ode to the waterway out the window and the lagoon that lies just beyond. When I entertain here or anywhere, I love to set the table with rock crystals, which capture candlelight and reflect it back in captivating ways. They are the inspiration for several objects in my new collection for global views, like these facet column sculptures. And again, the facet table lamp. And 
for the shape of the large bolt heads on the Roman tables and console. All of these in turn have been inspired by the 18th and 19th century rock crystal candelabra that I have loved throughout my entire career. Flanking the sides of this floor-to-ceiling Mondrian-inspired pieced mirror created for us by Barbini on the nearby island of Murano is another perfect opportunity for a pair of my quatrefoil sconces. Barbini has been a treasured source for over 40 years. The custom, comb texture, water-gilded frame is the creation of Venetian Alberto Cavalier, who was a boy in short pants assisting his father in creating many extraordinarily large mirrors for my design of Bellagio 25 years ago. In the corner, the beautiful Grand Tour bronze of a Roman satyr is waiting for one of my Proust pedestals in the gray sandblasted finish. I love using pedestals to raise objects to eye level or for large table lamps to bring lighting to exactly the right flattering height for illuminating aging faces. The inspiration for this neoclassic pedestal are many. The leg of this 1945 Andre Arbus desk and this 1930s pedestal with candelabra or this Pierre Gold 17th century pedestal table. I also think that this 1770 tall case clock from the Frick Collection in New York, which is my favorite museum, had at least a subconscious role in the conception of the Proust pedestal. Our kitchen was a dining room for the previous 250 years. Everything seen in our kitchen must be both beautiful and functional because this is the inevitable gathering place for guests. Everyone sees the kitchen. Here, we have a beautiful Giopanti dining table from the 1950s with a pair of Osvaldo Borsani chairs from the same era covered in Rubelli fabrics. I'm thinking that my new Titian dining table and a pair of sane dining chairs in gray would be the perfect upgrade. They would look great next to this wonderful 1940s Italian banquette and complement the important Tiepolo canvas we brought to the space as an unexpected focal point. I believe the most treasured works of art should be where you see them most often, even if that's in a kitchen or bathroom. I love surprises, so you'll find some of our largest examples of Murano glass from the 1930s and 40s are at the top of the cabinets. Perhaps I need another of my new large bronze vases here as well. I'm also thinking of using my gunmetal ring vases here in the kitchen as countertop utensil holders. I love the simplicity of these vase forms, which remind me of this beautiful example also by Dagobert Pekka, from the early decades of the 20th century. The texture of this beautiful cast iron decoration by Andre Arbus inspired my Milano bowl, which could also work in the kitchen. The 18th century gilded Italian mirror hanging above the sink allows me to enjoy the reflection of the room and to join in conversation while washing dishes, one of my favorite pastimes. Yes, I really love to wash dishes. This is a great location for my new Soleil mirror in nickel. It was inspired by a 19th century example I found at the Paris flea market. This large space was once a formal dining room. We wanted a warm and dramatic haven. The coral color was inspired by the stucco of the palazzo seen from the windows across the cortile. Another two-inch decorative flat tape from Samuel and Sons adds a distinguishing touch. The red coral terrazzo floor with a custom wool and silk area rug from Laloi Milano completes the rich layering of color. The custom headboard in precious pigeon blood colored silk velvet also from Rubelli, is button-tufted to add to the opulence of the room. 
The linens were custom colored for us by Frate to coordinate with the brightest and richest tones of the palette. Warmth, like a bed on fire. All different shades of corals and reds mixing together into one bold statement. I'm considering a pair of my China Shield mirrors to hang above the different antique nightstands to bring light to the room and focus to the bed wall. These mirrors were inspired by my love of 18th century examples and informed by my exploration of the Chinoiserie period while I was designing resorts in China. I would also love to see my Paris desk as one of the bedside tables. It is so practical to have the function and scale of an elegant desk in the bedroom for personal correspondence and nighttime notes. Desktops hold no end of nighttime reading and lighting. The console under the 19th century Venetian painting titled Et an Arcadia Ego is perfect with the red on red tone of this room but I would love to try my Roman console with gilded legs and white marble top in the same location. My inspiration for the Roman tables came from a couple of sources. The silhouette of the leg was inspired by Thomas Chippendale, who created this masterful console design in the 18th century. So slim and such elegant proportions. I have wanted to honor the genius of the horizontal, fluted, or chisel, gilded bronze texture of this David Rungan architect's desk created in 1785 for decades. I love the way light plays over the surface, creating an animated presence on an inanimate object. What's now our principal bathroom was, until three years ago, the kitchen. It had a small dining area for the maid, the cook, and the private gondoliere. Where they once dined, one now bathes amid the drama of a large Barbini Murano mirror, a 19th century Venetian grotto chair, and a 19th century bronze cast of a Pompeian table that is now in a Naples museum. I'm thinking of adding a Roman drinks table in nickel finish with black marble top to this mix. I love groupings of tables. To balance this, we found this large cabinet from the 1920s created by the genius of early 20th century Italian design, Tommaso Buzzi. Buzzi also created the chandelier in the kitchen and influenced the design details of the previous 1950s renovation of this apartment. We used the top of this cabinet as a display opportunity for our collections, taking advantage of the five meter ceiling height. I can see adding more of my accessories for global views to this display, perhaps a Ming bonsai sculpture or both sizes of my teardrop vases. Personal spaces should be very personal. They should contain the things that speak to you and that you love. We spend a lot of time in this room, and it's important to me to have beautiful objects in the spaces I use most. Changing the objects on this cabinet from time to time refreshes them and makes us see them in new light. Different associations and combinations give different meanings. Changing and moving accessories is a wonderful game that I play often. I invite you to try it. Another bathroom, a powder room, has retained both its original use and the original wear Giallo Antico marble walls, save one, which was destroyed beyond repair in a plumbing mishap. We mirrored the entire lost wall, hanging the spectacular 1920s Venetian edged mirror with an image of Neptune surrounded by this delightful French brass frame. This was a favorite find at a Paris auction. That same auction supplied the Venetian glass pendants made in the late 40s or early 50s. My new Roman drinks table would be perfect here next to the sink for guest towels. I think I'll try that next. 
The family that renovated the apartment in the 1950s was in shipping and added this porthole window. Here, I have displayed a collection of unexpected objects just to surprise our guests. The beautiful small lamp is by Jean-Michel Franck and was made in 1924. It endures as the most contemporary lamp design I know. The lamp was a gift from Patrick Fortin, our favorite gallery of French design in Paris. It is joined by a Roman marble fragment and by my Acropolis tissue holder for La Brazelle, carved from a single block of Arabescato marble. The branches in the black lacquer vase are mesquite from my native state of Nevada, which have been dipped 30 times into matte coral paint. I mentioned earlier that we turned the existing main bedroom into our dining room. We decided to leave a nearby full bathroom in place. The idea of a bathtub with a view of the Grand Canal was too delightful and indulgent to resist. Tucked away on an upper level is a room once occupied by the family's private gondoliere, a luxury that has unfortunately gone the way of the motorized motoscafo taxi, which can be summoned in just a few minutes. This is what it looked like when we bought the apartment. This is what it is now. A quiet and restful haven for guests, a secure retreat from a busy Venetian itinerary. I match the paint against the Grand Canal waters of a November evening. Here again, I'd like to use my facet lamps at the bedside, and this is the perfect place for the Paris wall console. It can serve as a sleek, considerate, and space-saving bedside table. It's just the right size to hold both the lamp along with a laptop and phone for busy guests. I designed and stitched all the needlepoint pillows you may have noticed scattered around the place. The work offers a listening meditation while in conversations with friends and family. The small framed work of art next to the window was created by Ruth Martin, my best friend now and from my days at the Boston Museum School. And now one final stop at what was perhaps the most unlikely transformation in the whole project. This room had been the maid's sleeping quarters with a tiny sink in one corner. Now, it's a lavish guest bathroom. After 40 years of designing hotels, guest bathrooms are a specialty of mine, and I always want them to be both memorable and the ultimate in function and comfort. Here there's a bit of a surprise composition, a 19th century Ethiopian chief's chair carved in one piece from a log and a 1930s table made to furnish a Yellowstone Park honeymoon cottage complete with elk hoof feet and antler pieces for top supports. That completes the tour of our Venetian hideaway. I hope that sharing my joys and inspirations here gives some idea of the thought and passion that has inspired all of the pieces in my collections for Global Views and Studio A. Their talents, experience, and global resources have made designing the latest collection an absolute delight. I hope you share my delight as you experience these new additions. If the tour or the collections have brought up any questions at all, I've got time to answer them if you've got time to ask them. I'll see you soon live. Thank you for being with me for this tour.